thanks again for really this, this amazing prize, this amazing opportunity to share some, some pretty exciting science. And But before I do so, I'd like to share a tiny bit about uh, my, my background. So I've, I've really been fortunate, in a sense, to travel the world for my education and my early career. And I think that's what makes me now, really. Um, my bachelor in chemistry started at McGill and finished at Northwestern, where I stayed on for a PhD. I was advised by Rick Van Dyne, famous for surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy, and Lawrence Marks, who's famous for the Marks decahedron. I also spent three months in Melbourne, carefully avoiding a Chicago winter. I moved uh, to Cambridge after that for a postdoc in an electron microscopy group. And just, so to, uh, just after a year of postdoc, I moved continents once again and started as an assistant professor in material science and in chemistry at Rice. I spent four years at Rice and I moved once again, um, and this time back to Cambridge, where I'm now jointly appointed in material science and earth science. I'm also an adjunct at Rice University and at University Laval in Quebec City. So all this traveling and moving around um, helped me grow as a scientist, and, and it could have made me feel uprooted. But in fact, what it did to me is that it created a strong sense of network and belonging to a scientific community that spans the entire globe. Uh, so I really want to thank today this Plasmonics community for all of their support over the year. This is a really vibrant, supportive, and collaborative network that I'm just really outrageously proud to be part of. Uh, and, and I'm showing here a, a 2018 photo from one of the conferences a lot of us go to. It's not everyone, uh, but if you're in that photo, thank you. And if you're not in that photo, but you know you're in the community, thank you uh, as well. It's just a great community. Uh, another set of people who've made a big difference in my career are my students, both at Rice and in Cambridge. And it's been wonderful to work with, with brilliant people uh, and work through the ups and downs together. Uh, but moving to science, okay? So one of the key materials in my scientific field is gold. And here's gold, okay? It's, it's yellow, it's shiny, and small coins are just the same color as big blocks of gold. Yeah. Um, that's not true at a nanoscale. So gold was used in medieval stained glass to produce red color, and silver was used to produce yellow color. That's because at the nanoscale, gold's no longer yellow and shiny, and silver is no longer silvery and shiny. The phenomenon giving rise to these color is called localized surface plasmon resonance, and I'll probably just say plasmon as, as a shorthand. Uh, this occurs in a metallic particle that's smaller than the wavelength of light, so smaller than a few hundred nanometers, truly a nanoscale phenomenon. Uh, the electron cloud in these particles is driven into a resonant oscillation by the oscillating electric field of light that leads to light absorption, light scattering, and strong localized field around the particle surface due to this electron motion. Each material, each size, each shape has specific resonant frequency giving rise to light matter interaction, thus color. So a, a gold cube is in fact no longer the same color as a gold nano coin. Following craftsmen of the medieval time, scientists such as Faraday became interested in gold colloids and their fascinating colors. And here's a flask of Faraday's gold colloids um, just here in London. But what I want to say really is it's not, it's not all about color. I want to say that making color is just one of the uses of light matter interactions. And, and an obvious example of, of another use of light matter interaction is solar panels, which turn light's energy into electricity or heat, sometimes held by a solar concentrator. Uh, decades of research have gone into this, this amazing technology. Light is also the source of energy for plants, which are the basis of our food supply. So converting light's energy is, is pretty key to our civilization. So my research looks into ways to harness light, but not with silicon or plants, but rather with these small colored metal nanoparticles. So localized surface plasmon resonance, plasmons, uh, orange only color. This electron oscillation leads to a strong localization of the electric field at the surface of the particle, where it can be enhanced several orders of magnitude 
Uh, that's the basis of surface enhanced Raman spectroscopy or other surface enhanced spectroscopies, for instance. But that resonance, that oscillation motion is short lived, a couple tens of femtoseconds. Uh, and upon decay, it gives rise to energized charge carrier as well as localized heat. Both of these can carry the energy of light. So the idea here okay, is to use these metal particles as antenna for light which will allow us to use free and abundant sunlight to drive energy intensive processes such as chemical reactions. The current state of the art in most chemical reaction is of course to use a catalyst which helps increase yield, increase selectivity and decrease energy requirement. But even the best catalyzed reaction still require vast quantities of energy which are predominantly supplied at the moment with fossil fuels. So meanwhile, in less than two hours, the sun provides as much energy as we use in, in a year. So if we combine sunlight harvesting and catalysis, we could run chemical reactions in a much more sustainable manner. Uh, unfortunately, there are not that many materials that sustain plasma on resonances. I'm showing the good ones here in green, uh, copper, silver, gold, aluminum, magnesium, and the alkaline. However, silver and gold are prohibitively expensive for large-scale applications. Our idea is to turn to something a lot more earth abundant that's capable of strong resonances matched with the solar spectrum. It's really important. A good answer to that is magnesium, which is incidentally also key to our food supply via the magnesium-centered chlorophyll. Uh, an obvious challenge of using magnesium is its stability and its reactivity. We've been working with this, this element at the nanoscale, as a metal at the nanoscale for five years, and we know very well now that a thin self-limiting oxide layer stabilizes the particles in air and in organic, sol in organic solvent. But they are indeed not stable in, in water. So our approach to overcome this is to develop coatings, additives, and alloys that eliminate that reactivity with the surrounding environment. Another big challenge in the field is that these earth abundant plasmonics are not established catalysts and the best catalysts are not really plasmonic, they don't capture life. Uh, there's also a really fundamental size clash in that we want quite large particles to capture light but really small particle for catalysis. So one of the solution is to make a bimetallic where there's a core of earth abundant plasmonic metal decorated by small catalytic uh, particles. That way we combine both functionalities and that's exactly what we've done with aluminum uh, back when I was at Rice. Now this idea is moving to magnesium where catalyst decorated particle capture light and drive efficiently catalyze chemical reactions. So we're moving towards turning free and abundant sunlight into valuable, sustainable chemistry. However, along the way, there are many challenges. I've identified a few already, and there's gonna be many, many more. Uh, finally, uh, I really believe that these are challenges worth addressing, worth working on, as successful implementation of earth abundant plasmonic would lead to many applications above and beyond what I discussed. Uh, magnesium, for instance, is biocompatible. It can be used to reduce our reliance on fossil fuels and together with the other earth abundant plasmonic forms a new toolbox for enhanced light matter interactions for the decades to come. Uh, with that, I'll stop and thank you for your attention. Thank you, Emily, for that wonderful talk. Um, I'll ask, um, you know, you, you mentioned that there were still some challenges ahead. You know, do you have plans to commercialize any of this technology or how far out does that feel for when these might be used kind of in the in the world? Yeah, so, so I think magnesium is the next big thing in plasmonics. And there have been commercial or near commercial implementations of, of the other plasmonics. 
And so we are just, just around the corner, I think, for things like photothermal therapy, things like photocatalysis. Um, I would say it were sort of a, a five-year horizon to, uh, to, to real sort of commercializable technology. And, and, and really the key is to, well, to first of all convince people that, that magnesium is not as reactive as they might think, and then, and, and then, and then really show the large scale implementation. Thank you so much, Emily. Well, to keep us on time, I think we'll probably move on to our next speaker. We really appreciate you being here this morning.